Welcome to another episode of What's Up Prof. Welcome, Walter. We're back in the old setting, Martin. Yeah, well, at least we have some of the, the backdrop that we, where we were. An African sunset. Yeah. Or was it an African sunrise? I think this was a sunset. It was a sunset. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, well, you titled this one Absentee Landlord. Yes. Can we pray and then you uh, d explain to us how you got to this? All right, let's do that. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for bringing us together again. Thank you for every blessing that you bestow upon us. And we ask that you now also enlighten our minds with the Holy Spirit. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Martin, Satan accuses God of being an absentee landlord. And then we struggle along in life, and we sometimes despair. Now, my wife re recently wrote a book. Mm. Well, she's been writing it for a long, long time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And she's been thinking, do I do this? Do I not do this? Do I do this? Do I not do this? Uh, what is the right thing to do? Because sometimes you have experiences where you where you report things and people might perceive it as turning your weapons against the church. Uh, yes, correct. And uh, that is the last thing that we would want to do. But to be an ostrich and put your head in the sand is also not wise. No. Because people will suddenly come into situations that they never expect and they walk in the front door and they walk out the back door. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, this is still God's church, and God's people. And there are lessons to be learned. And one doesn't give up, one continues. So she wrote a book about our life story yes. called Dwelling in, a, in the Secret Place. I thought it was quite a nice title. And it's available now, and people can download it for free. Yes, yeah. it's on our website. The links will be in the description as well. We encourage you to read it. Yes. Because like you just mentioned. Not as a negative, no. but as a positive. What, a is, what is the outcome of all of this? Because a lot of people just want to give up and go. Yes. Never give up. Never give up. Don't go. No. Outside is not is part of shaken out. Correct. So... Just for those who might be interested in this story. And uh, of course, you can't tell, cannot tell everything in a story like that. Because some things, as we put it there in the beginning, for the sake of prudence, <laughs> the best or the worst stories are not even included. Because that would take another book. But we'll leave that for heaven. <laughs> we can we can cry on each other's shoulders there or yeah. laugh about it we, laugh are, we about won't it. have to because god every tear will be wiped away yes <laughs> we'll laugh about that it. that won't be a problem anymore okay so but that links back in because obviously in your life you haven't heard absentee landlord the accusation of satan towards god only once no i've heard it many many times and it, it leaves room for thought. Why does God operate like he operates? What is that movie, Martin, where yeah. Satan accuses God of being the absentee landlord? When you, when you gave me this to work through and I saw that title, it immediately, because that, unfortunately, I watched that movie when I was not an Adventist yet or when I still watched movies. I wouldn't suggest people watch it. Please it not. It is a tremendous distortion. Yes, because it, the movie's name was um, a Devil's Advocate and with Al Pacino and Keanu Reeves. And Al Pacino portrayed the, the devil. And he was there in one scene shouting about this absentee landlord. Now, actually, what he said, and that's the thing, so it's ringing in my mind still that, that, that part of the film because you can't get rid of it. But... Um, He's actually portraying exactly how the devil is accusing God. Yes. And uh, 
he did a good job, <laughs> but it's a distorted job. And if you want to see it from, from that perspective, then God is indeed an absentee landlord. I mean, why did deism come into existence? And remember that uh, even Miller, yes, William Miller, was a theist for quite a while, and the entire circle of people of influence in his time were basically deists. It was basically the enlightened ones. Yes, they were the enlightened ones, and uh, many of the people involved in the American uh -huh. government mm -hmm. and in the Constitution, uh, they were deists. Yeah. And deism portrays God as the absentee landlord. Now, why do people think like that? They think like that because this world is in such a mess. Mm. Everything is in such a mess. And the landlord's not taking care of it. No, he just He's leaves. just leaving it. And uh, this is the devil's accusation. And in that movie, he actually said, you know, he gets his hands dirty. He's busy with the nitty gritty of this world trying to sort things out. But that one, my goodness, he's just the absentee landlord. Now, one thing negates the absentee landlord picture, and that's the cross. Exactly. That shows you exactly how intimately involved God is. Correct. <laughs> so the cross and the absentee landlord, they don't gel. Something is amiss. But the accusations are real. Mm. If something goes wrong in this world, it's an act of God. Yeah. Now, if it was an act of God, then isn't he involved? That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what a statement. Yeah, exactly. Okay, then, it's, then he's involved. But he's only involved in the negative. Yes. Not in the positive. If anything happens that man could not control, that's God's fault. So the devil says, if, you, if you're happy, it's because of him. If you're miserable, it's because of God. Yeah. And it's portrayed in, in, in everything, in, in every way of thinking. If somebody dies, then people shout, God, why did you do this to me? God is the God of the negatives, and the devil is the God of the positives. Mm. Or so it seems. But then why is the world in such a mess? Well, because he's an absentee landlord. You can see the circle the goes round and round. And the and whole round. time the accusation is back. It's God's fault. It's God's fault. Everything is God's fault. So I thought it's time that we just had a look at the concept of the absentee landlord. And let me get my trusty little clicker into action. So titled Absentee Landlord. And here are just some thoughts. The most important lesson that we need to learn in order to get to heaven is to understand the root of sin. Mm -hmm. Sin is an intruder, and it needs to be rooted out. It is a destroyer of relationships, and therefore contrary to the principle of love. And the Bible says God is love. So sin must be an intruder, right? Because yeah. it's contrary to the principle of love. The root of all sin is selfishness, mm -hmm. and the root of all goodness is selflessness, or humility. Now those are the aspects that you find in God, That's it. who is portrayed as the villain in all of these uh, movies and in all occult writings. I mean, Blavatsky puts it quite plainly, that God is to blame for everything. Mm -hmm. He's the evil one. He's the serpent. Yeah. She turns it round, right? So, we don't need false humility, but you need real humility. So all relationships operate on one principle, and that principle is love. But it's interesting how the devil distorts mm. love. Hollywood oh, yeah. portrays love as eros. Mm. Passion. From where you get yeah, the word erotic from. Mm. So Hollywood's love is eros. Eros is not even mentioned in the Bible. Yeah. You have phileo, mm -hmm. 
from which you get the word Philadelphia, brotherly okay. love. And you have agapeo, which is selfless love, which the world doesn't even recognize. The ancient Greeks never even recognized agapeo. But it's the highest form of love in the Bible. Yeah, yeah. And the unrecognizable absentee <laughs> quality on earth. So we need real humility. All relationships operate on one principle, and that principle is love. It's other-centeredness. Cent yes. Love is a principle, and it's not a feeling. But it's not devoid of feeling. Of course you have feelings. But the feelings mustn't be the guide. The principle must be the guide. Yes, the sequence must be right. Yes. It's yes. A, it's, it's like the commandments and works. Yes. You don't have works to get, to get faith. You Correct. have faith and out of that flows your works. So God in his wisdom put the brain on top <laughs> and the mouth second. <laughs> <laughs> Often the mouth controls <laughs> whereas the head should control. That's exactly. And the next one down is the stomach. <laughs> yes. And the lower down you go on the body, the more power they seem to have. <laughs> but it should be the power. reverse. <laughs> it should all be controlled by principle. We all need a great reset. Yes, we need a great reset. You see, all relationships are, are built on this aspect of love. But sometimes you have to tame the passion in order to elevate the principle. Mm. You know, Martin, if you, uh, if you, let's use an example. Someone with patience working with an untrainable horse. Mm -hmm. That when you come into that arena and you're trying to train this horse that throws off everyone, nobody can work with that horse. And whipping didn't help, it just made him worse. And you get this one person a horse whisperer. Mm. And this horse becomes tamer and tamer and tamer. And eventually it walks up to the man or the woman, whoever it is, and puts the head next <laughs> to that head. Then you have a relationship. But the relationship could not exist before the temperament was tamed. Mm. Isn't that so? Yeah, that's true. If you get a, a dog out of, a, a, an abused dog mm -hmm. out of a pound, a whimpering little hound with ears drooping, tails between the legs, sitting in a corner, shaking with fear. That's the other opposite, right? That's it. From this high-spirited aggression. And nothing works with this dog except patience, love, kindness. Actually, the same remedy. The same remedy. <laughs> and eventually, the ears go up, the tail comes up, comes closer, learns to trust humanity again. And before long, he's running around, bounding around, playing with balls, happy as a lock, right? Mm -hmm. That's how it happens. So love is the principle. And uh, if love doesn't control the passions, and the feelings, then the passions and the feelings reign and the principle disappears. Yeah. That's a very good explanation on both sides, like you just mentioned. So everything in the spectrum of how we use our feelings yes. has to be get kept into harmony with love, then it will be balanced. Correct. And you can bring, you can bring this aspect into anything. You can bring it into worship. When feeling starts controlling the worship, you end up with eventually such characteristics that thinking people will be disgusted. Yeah. Right? In Genesis 3.22, we read, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us, to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. So what he did is he prevented him from eating from the tree of life and man was subject to death. Yeah. But that didn't mean that he rejected him mm -hmm. because he gave a promise of redemption, right? 
and we discussed that last time. So let's progress from there. But now we're going to go to the absentee landlord. So if he if he was so concerned about humanity that he was prepared to sacrifice himself for their redemption, then how does that fit in with an absentee landlord? There must be something that we're missing, right? That's it. That's it. Okay. So let's ask some questions. I know we can spend some time on questions. I like questions. No. And people always say, why do you ask stupid questions? There's no such thing as a stupid question, right? A question is a question, something that bothers some, someone. The only stupid question is the one never asked. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Very good, Martin. So why does God say man is become like one of us? What is it about man that even angels long to look into? All right, let's ask some questions. First question, does Satan hate God? Yes. He must, right? Mm -hmm. He must hate him with every fiber of his being. So every accusation that comes out of his mouth will be negative. Must be evaluated. Oh, and, that's it. Yeah. Even if it's positive, it must there might be something in there. There might be a twist in the mm. tail, right? All right, so Satan doesn't operate on the principle of love. He operates on the principle of hate. Yes. Hate is very powerful. Hate actually runs the world. What are wars about? That's it. It's about hate, right? Selfishness and hate. I think those two run together. You don't even know that you hate when you've got selfishness. Okay. Uh, and even in marriage, yeah. love can turn to hate. Mm -hmm. And hate is very destructive. But love is more powerful than hate. Did you know that? Yeah. Although it often seems to be the underdog. Mm. All right. So we've answered this question. Does Satan hate God? There's no doubt that he hates him with every fiber of his being. Why does he hate him? Because he's unselfish. God is yeah, unselfish. That's it. And he is selfish. And those two spirits clash. So the question is, why does he hate him? What character trait of God does he hate? Definitely the unselfishness. Definitely the unselfishness of God. But How can you be a ruler? How can you be a powerful ruler of the entire universe and not be absolutely in control and commandeering everyone to go mm. and do whatever it is your whim tells you. Yeah, you see, that's, the, that's a problem as well because like we've seen in the previous, selfishness is also linked to love. That's the definition. Mm -hmm. So, And that's why he hates it because it's not supposed, he doesn't want, what is this love? You're actually a softy, a yes. pushover when you're, Full of love. Why does the world love tyrants? Yeah. Until they see what tyranny, tyranny leads to. Then all of a sudden they hate it. Just for a while. And then they choose the next one. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Why is it? Because they, Satan rules the world. Now if you, you watch these, let's say in some of these communist countries, when the ruler comes in and everybody has to get up and clap like crazy. And if you don't, you probably end up somewhere in a dungeon, right? At worst, at best. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the kind of power that people want in a crisis. Democracy is the final step before tyranny, they say. And we're at that point now. Yeah. Well, democracy has run its course. And we're getting to the point where it's so out of control that the only thing that mankind wants is tyranny. And they're going to choose it. They're going to choose it. Yeah. And the result will be devastating. Yeah, destruction. Hasn't it been the same throughout history? That's it. But like with history tends to repeat itself. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. So would you agree, Martin, that the devil hates God because he hates the unselfish 
character trait that yeah. God has. That's for sure. The humility. Mm-hmm. The humility. Now, doesn't it say that Moses was the most humble of men? Yeah. Yet he was the leader, right? Yeah, he wasn't a pushover. No, he wasn't a pushover, but he was humble. All right, so let's ask the next question. Does Satan hate enough to kill? Yes. As he proved it? Yes. Did he even kill the Son of God? Yeah. Wasn't that his act, his actual target? 100%. That's what his, the whole thing was about. Now, what a pity for him mm. that that Son of God was God <laughs> so that he could rise from the dead. That must be very disconcerting. That's why he's so exceedingly vengeful now. All right. So let's get to the nitty-gritty question. Why is God an absentee landlord? Why did he say it is expedient for me to go so that the Holy Spirit can come? Mm. Can you see the Holy Spirit? No. No, you can't see the Holy Spirit. Can you experience him? Yes. All right, you can experience the, the Holy Spirit. That's a but where's Jesus? In heaven. So he's an absentee landlord. <laughs> yes, but he's sent a representative. A representative. Okay. So let's ask another question. What happened that necessitated such a drastic action? He had to become human. All right, he and, had to become human. Well, he gave up his omnipresence. Yes. Because he had to become human to save the human race. All right, so that really must require tremendous love, right? I mean, definitely. Okay, so what happened? There was this intruder in society, which was called sin. Mm. And sin needs to be eradicated from the heart, and it needs to be eradicated from the mind, and sin is based on selfishness. Every single aspect. Why would you want another God besides you? Mm. Because of selfishness. selfishness right? for sure. Why would you not want to acknowledge the one true God? Yeah. Because of selfishness. That's it. Because why self- would you want to kill or steal or murder in order to avoid being associated with him? No. Selfishness. selfishness. Okay. So the answer is sin entered the universe. So the next question is, who's to blame? Well, now Satan accuses God, but it's actually his, his fault. It's a Satan's fault. Yes, he was perfect mm. from the day that he was created until iniquity, sin, was found in him. Mm. So he was created perfect, but that doesn't exclude the capacity to sin. In other words, you must have freedom of choice in order to be able to sin. Otherwise, you'd be a robot. That's it. And since love is unselfish, you cannot exclude something. No. So, as well, love is also not possible if there's no free choice. So, man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. God is not evil. No. But being God, he knows the consequences of evil it's almost as if you can say man now knows selfishness and unselfishness all right so now there's a choice to be made humanity has to make a choice between humility and unselfishness Mm. and arrogance and selfishness yeah there was actually selfishness that eve portrayed because satan said no you will God does not want you to be like him. You can be like him. So she wanted to be selfish. and She wanted to be like him. She wanted to have a position that was not assigned to her. To know everything. Yes. So who's to blame? According to the scriptures, Satan is to blame. According to Satan, God is to blame. Because he made a law. Why should holy beings such as himself be subject to a law? Sin is the transgression of the law. Okay. Now, we know who, according to the scripture, is to blame. 
But the next question is, who gets the blame? God. God gets the blame. Normally it's like that. <laughs> in, in, in anything, that the one that's trying to do the best and good, and <laughs> he's always blamed for everything. Yes, he's try, always being blamed. And uh, the peacekeeper mm. often becomes the worst enemy, right? <laughs> if you try and mediate in a marriage, for example, you become the enemy. That's it. I've experienced it a few times in my life. You try and sort things out and try and be uh, impartial as possible, but very soon you become the enemy. So it's a very, very thankless job. All right, the next question then, after we have ascertained who is to blame, ask ourselves the question, why does he get the blame? Why does God get the blame? Once again, it's selfishness. Because they don't want the love or the unselfishness that he gives. Okay. Were you created to be a groveling admirer? No. <laughs> exactly, no. Or were you re uh, created for relationship? That's it. And then through that experience, the wonderful blessings that unselfishness and love gives. Now, Martin, what must it be like to be created for relationship with God? Uh, it depends on who God is and what God is. Yeah. As to whether you would even want a relationship, right? So you can see it. Does he want, if, he, if you can understand that he wants the best for you, so then you will see that he is, uh, say for instance, the Ten Commandments is not there to keep you from having joy in life. It's actually there to give you joy in life. Okay, it depends what side of the equation you are on, right? Yes. So Martin, if you are dealing with someone who's totally unselfish, who's the beneficiary? You. Okay, and if you are dealing with someone who's totally selfish, who's the beneficiary? You. Ah, oh, okay. All right, so why does he get the blame? Well, because he created in the first place. Yeah. Don't the children say, I didn't ask to be here? Oh, yes. Eh? Now, why do they ask that question? And when do they ask that question? When? <laughs> so normally, they're in trouble. Ah, <laughs> when they have transgressed. Yes. <laughs> when they have transgressed, they say, <laughs> I didn't ask to be here. <laughs> I didn't ask to be here. Or when they ask to do something like wash the dishes or help in the house or whatever, I didn't ask to be here. You're supposed to be my slave. No, we're supposed to be a community. We're supposed to work together. Yeah. No, I didn't ask to be here. All right, so the blame game does the blame game come from the transgressor or does it come from the creator? No, the transgressor. We're getting somewhere, Martin. Yeah, yeah we can see why, why this whole great controversy is going on. All right, so we're living in a great blame game, yeah. are we not? Oh, <laughs> I always smile <laughs> when I read that portion of Genesis where it's Adam and Eve transgressed. No one is taking responsibility. They're just blaming the other. No, it's <laughs> <laughs> All the time. All right. Now, why does he get the blame? It's because he permitted it. Mm. Had, he should have been a tyrant. Mm. Then we wouldn't have had this yeah. nonsense. Exactly. True. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's like people, like you just mentioned earlier, they want a dictator. Yes. They scream against him, but then, like you said, just... The next election or the next one, they, nah, we want them back. We want them back. Okay. All right. So we've run through a, a whole host of questions. And the question is still, why is God an absentee landlord? What does he achieve by being an absentee landlord? He's definitely not doing it because of indifference. No, and also not of uncaringness. Because the cross negates that. Because that's a problem. People say, okay, like you mentioned, look at the, what's going on. How can a loving God 
let this happen. Okay. So let's try and dwell upon the question, why did he permit it? Why did he permit it? Okay, let's see if this makes any sense. Because he had sin more than the consequences. He was prepared to bear the consequences himself. Does that make sense? It makes sense. Because it's the only way that he can show that it's, he can set it right. Okay. The only way, because otherwise all the other accusations will be true. Okay, so can we safely say, and the Bible says it quite clearly, that God hates sin. Yes. So if he hates sin, then why did he permit it? Because obviously sin was going to have consequences. Yes. Right? But he permitted it anyway. He had to. Because the, the, the alternative was to create you a robot. Yeah. And then you don't have love. No. So he had to permit it because only if there is the choice to sin, there can be love. Okay. That's actually a very <laughs> scary thought. Scary thought. Okay. So he had to permit it or else he's not a God of love. He could have chosen not to create it. But then you don't have a relationship. Yeah. It's worth nothing. So he was prepared to bear the consequences himself. So what does that tell you about his longing for relationship? Yeah. That's why he actually created I'm sure. All right, so the longing for relationship must be so great that he was prepared to die for it. Yeah. That's quite a thought, eh? The longing for relationship was so great that he was prepared to die for it. Now, if, you, if your longing for relationship is so great that you are prepared to die for it, why would you be an absentee landlord? If you long for a relationship with a woman, and that you, you love, <laughs> <laughs> why would you by choice be an absentee landlord? Does that make sense? Not a lot, no. <laughs> okay, we're running through some thoughts here, but uh, I hope the people will understand well, what we're trying to get at. Well, if you take it like this, that will show you if she really loves you, if you have this distance. Okay. For if she can continue keeping your love of your life, if she keeps faithful to you, even though you're absent from her. All right. Let's let's take a situation of war. Mm. And uh, you are taken away on a war mission. You enter into no. You climb on board of that big vessel and you wave goodbye with many, many tears, and off you sail, perhaps to be gone for a number of years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that surely puts a test Definitely. to a relationship, Definitely. doesn't it? Yeah. If it's still there when you come back, then you, know. you, can, you can safely tie that knot forever. Yeah. So I think there's very much method in what he's doing. Okay. All right. So what were the consequences? They were pain, suffering, and death. Mm. Now, if he left us to those, then he would be an absentee landlord. Yeah. But if he embraced them himself, mm. is he then an absentee landlord? Not at all. He might be gone, but, but he, he's not absent. No. All right. And if you are on that military expedition, if you've been sent away to the army, where's your heart? On the other side of the ocean. <laughs> on the other side of the ocean. And, like you said, he, he came and he actually paid all of this himself. Well, when he became absentee, when he ascended to heaven, he sent a representative of himself to be here still. Correct. To, to work with hearts and minds. Hearts and minds. So in actual fact, 
through his representative, he's not absentee. Okay, let's ask another question. We've now concluded that he hates sin. Mm. Does that mean that he hates the sinner? So does he hate the sinner? No. 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 He we loves tend to do that. Oh, yes. Somebody that transgresses <laughs> against you, you tend to hate the person rather than the deed. In fact, you hate the person more than the deed. Yeah. Uh, you really want to sort that person out, don't you? Yep. Okay. That's a lesson. Well, what does God want to do to that he person? He wants to save the sinner. He wants to redeem him. Mm. All right. So let's ask the other question. Do we hate the sinner? Unfortunately, this asks, do we, not should we? So do we? Yes. Should we hate the sinner? No. Okay. All right, Martin, so are there lessons to be learned? Yes. Now, how much do we actually hate the sinner? Do we hate the sinner enough to kill him or her? Actually, yes. Otherwise, we wouldn't have the situations on earth, right? We wouldn't have wars. We wouldn't have anything. You know, you can put this literal and you can put it spiritual. Because do we hate the sinner enough not to even evangelize him or talk to him and thereby, in effect, kill him. Now, when Paul was persecuting the Christians and in vision, the representative of God on earth, the human representative, was told, Paul is praying. He says, Lord, do you not know what this man is doing? No, I want you to go and anoint him. And I want you to take him up into the fold as a brother. Uh, was even that representative spluttering? Of course. <laughs> but if you put yourself in that one, if there's somebody going out there that's constantly, and you know he is the top ranked, okay, this one was now a spiritual one, but he's the top ranked, say, atheist that's getting rid of people. And you have to go and anoint him. <laughs> a very tough thing to do. All right, so we actually hate sinners enough to kill them. Or if someone transgressed against you. Mm. And uh, when it comes to some relationships, I mean, why do we have sayings about ladies that have been uh, scorned in a relationship? Hell has no fury as a woman scorned. There's a lot of animosity that comes out. Okay, do we transfer the hatred for the deed to the perpetrator? Yes. We do, eh? Yeah, that's it. We, the deed falls into the background eventually. Yes. You just get this, you start building up this whole hate for that perpetrator. And when you look at propaganda, mm. Let's say war propaganda. Don't you uh, create an atmosphere of hatred for the other party? That, hundred percent for the, for for a total for a people. Yes, for a whole nation. How crazy is that? I mean, just take this for instance. You have brothers in the faith in that country as well. Yes. As well as in this country. But you're told to go and kill them all. And then, huh? It it doesn't even make sense. How can you partake in this? Okay, so this is the mess that we are in, and we're still trying to answer the question. Why is he an absentee landlord? Right? So we're approaching it a bit uh, obliquely. We're coming from the side of asking questions. Because basically what we need to do in this life is we need to understand the character and the mindset of God. Mm. Because if we don't, we will end up like the devil, hating him. That's it. And we have to be of one mind with him, so that we can be of one accord and one mind together. You're absolutely right. So are we inclined to transfer the hatred to the one who permitted it? That's, that's <laughs> a bit more complicated. No, but that's exactly what happened. Because now, you, that's what happens. The perpetrator, you hate him actually now at the end more than what he did. 
And then you start hating, obviously, God for permitting it. All right. Let's say you have uh, parents. One is abusive. The other one is submissive. And the child suffers at the hands of the abuser. Mm. The child can actually start hating the other parent who, who permitted it without saying anything. Yeah. So hatred doesn't have to necessarily only be towards the perpetrator. It can actually be to the one who permitted it. And sometimes the hatred towards the one who permitted it can be even greater. Mm, worse, yeah. Because you feel abandoned. You feel a sense of abandonment. Abandonment. Isn't that an absentee landlord? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. is it possible that when life throws you a curveball, that you can become full of animosity to the one who permitted it? it, it that's most of the time that what happens. All right. So if something happens in your life, somebody dies, somebody's killed in a car accident, your fury and your anger and your sadness is often directed towards someone. Mm. You have to get rid of it somewhere. Yeah. You have to unload it. That's it. So who are you going to unload it on? Normally the one that you're actually supposed to run to. Okay, so you start hating the one who can, who's the only one who can comfort you. Yeah. The world is in a mess, Martin. The world is in a mess. Is God wise? All wise. All right, the Bible says so. Is his wisdom being seriously challenged oh, here? Oh, yes. Hmm? Definitely. Okay. So let's ask, the question then, do we play the blame game? <laughs> That's for sure. Nobody it's, will. It, it started with the blame game. You said it right from the beginning. The woman you gave me. That's the serpent the you serpent. created. Why'd you create that stupid serpent? <laughs> it's your fault. <laughs> exactly. The whole time, it's his fault. <laughs> Whatever happens, it's his fault. And so the, when, when Adam said, the woman you gave me, who's the accusation against? God. Not against the woman. No, God. It's against God. The serpent you created. Yeah. Who's God the accusation? Again. God again. <laughs> it's, never, it's not even the serpent's fault or anything. It's God's fault. No, it's never your fault. No. <laughs> That's blame game that you just asked. I, I, you know how much better everything will start going if just everybody starts taking responsibility without blame, just blaming. Okay. All right, now if you had a referee who could sort all of this out and keep everything under perfect control all the time, wouldn't it be better? So don't we need a tyrant, Martin? Yeah. Don't we, we need a strong man who will sort these things out? Exactly. Eh? Is the world looking for one? Yes. The world is looking for one and they want w to blame someone. And will they get him? Yes. Okay. But who will he blame? He also has someone to blame. He will blame God again. God. He'll blame God. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we've come almost full circle. So the absentee landlord is actually not unrepresented. He is represented by his representatives. Mm -hmm. So he's actually given the gift of the Holy Spirit and he has, through the Holy Spirit, transformed people so as to represent him. So he's not unrepresented. Yeah. He's just not physically here. Yeah. But he's not unrepresented. Okay. And these representatives are actually fellow sufferers whom he calls friends. Is that right? That's it. So he's n you're not going through this alone. Okay. Now, why would he choose to be represented by representatives rather than present himself? Well, he did. Yes, you're right. He actually did, but for a very short time. Yeah. Did they like it? No. 
<laughs> no, no, they hated it. All right, why did they hate it? Be I don't know, because they didn't want him here. Why did they not they, want they him here? Because, because he was unselfish and they were selfish. That's it. Again, the same thing that happened in heaven actually re-happened on earth. Okay, now let's say he came again in the form of a humble servant to humanity. <laughs> What would they do? The same. They're going to do exactly the same. They were going to do the same. So had he been here constantly, <laughs> he would have been sacrificed how many times over by now? <laughs> constantly. But if he came as a tyrant, they would have loved him. <sighs> this is a very serious issue. Martin. I mean, that's what they actually thought he was going to even his disciples they wanted him to take the throne and get rid of the note <laughs> okay so his representatives hmm. are they suffering yes his representatives are suffering isn't he then a selfish god who says all right i'm not going to suffer you can suffer in my stead well actually no they're just showing that he's worthy because the same that they go through is what people are doing to him all right i think we're getting somewhere now so Martin, if he uses the representatives who become fellow sufferers, they can only become fellow sufferers if they understand the mindset of God because only if they understand the mindset of God will they want to be partakers with him in his suffering. That's it. And exactly, because you won't want to suffer if it's not for a good cause. Okay. So in other words, you must be convinced that the, lap, that the absentee landlord in your personal experience is actually not absent, but very much involved. Yes. And actually that everything he stands for is worthy, is mm. what you also then want to stand for. All right. But if you are standing outside of this relationship, can you see it? No. All you see is an absentee landlord. That's it. Because you don't see the presence of the landlord in the suffering and activities of his representatives. Okay. I think it's... So a, is he absent? No. Not <laughs> at all. Yeah, you see, it's because those that are in relationship with him, they understand his character. They start understanding what it means when he's unselfish. Okay. John 14 verse 7 says, If you had known me, ye should have known my Father also, and from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. Have they actually seen him? Not physically, no. They saw his representative. That's it. But he says when you saw him, you saw the Father. Okay. So if you want to know Jesus... Should you be able to recognize him in his representatives? Yes. Mm -hmm. Do we do a good job at that? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> no. Martin, you're very pessimistic. What's wrong with you? <laughs> God said, if he, if he turns, will you find faith? And by the way, all? this is a very serious subject. Why are we laughing all the time? Because we're also guilty. <laughs> so. Okay. All right. John 15, verse 15. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Do we know the origin of sin? Yes. Do we understand its consequences? Mm -hmm. Do we feel it in our own skins? Mm -hmm. We can see it all around us. Okay, so if you rightly represent him, then is he absent? No. No, huh? No. Now, Martin, doesn't he say that if you overcome, you will sit with him in his throne? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In other words, your mindset will be such that he can safely rule together with you. Now, would a tyrant like that? No. Nobody sits on his throne <laughs> next to him. Huh? 
the Führer, <laughs> would he would he like someone to, you know, sit Shit. right not only next to him? That would might still be tolerable, but to sit in him in his throne to be part and parcel of every decision would he like that? No, no then he's no longer a tyrant. Mm. Tells you something about the character of God, right? Yeah. Okay. So in order to represent him, we must know him. So how, Martin, do we get to know him? By having a relationship. By start, and the only way to have that is for, from what he's left us, and okay. that's his word. That's very good. Okay, let's have a look how we get to know him. There are a few ways in which we can get to know him so that we may represent him. And if he is perfectly represented, then he's not absent. We can get to know him through prayer. Mm -hmm. When self is woven into our labors, then the truth we bear to others does not sanctify, refine, and ennoble our own hearts. It will not testify that we are fit vessels for the Master's use. It is only through fervent prayer that we may hold sweet fellowship with Jesus. Fellowship, is that absentee or is that present? Definitely present. Okay. And through this blessed communion, the words and the Spirit are made fragrant with the Spirit of Christ. There is not a heart that will not bear watching. Jesus, the precious Savior, enjoined watchfulness. The oversight of self must not be relaxed for a moment. The heart must be kept with diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Watch and discipline the thoughts that you may not sin with your lips. Mm. Martin, the representative must have the same mindset towards sin as the one you are representing. Yeah, right? correct. Otherwise it's Futile. He must hate sin. Mm. He must also have the same mindset towards the sinner mm -hmm. or else he won't represent him. He must also have the same character or else he cannot be a good representative. So you better be in communion with him and that you do through fervent prayer. Mm -hmm. You hold fellowship with him. And you have to discipline your thoughts so that you may not sin with your lips. Once again, is that sequence? Okay. Because mind mm -hmm. first over the rest. First, it starts here and then goes down, not the other way around. Okay. The second way we have fellowship with Jesus is through the Word. Mm. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. No man, woman, or youth can attain to Christian perfection and neglect the study of the Word of God. By careful and closely searching His Word, we shall obey the injunctions of Christ. Search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. This search enables the student to closely observe the divine model for they testify of Christ. The pattern must be inspected often and closely in order to imitate it. So Martin, if he were present, would we learn any of these things or would we just... We won't need to study it in the Word anymore. No. He will be there. So He will be there. Yeah. Do we have to exercise our own... Uh, initiatives and judgments as well when he's there or could we leave it all up to him? Then you could leave it all up to him. Yeah, he could do it all and you yeah. could take a back seat and watch the show, right? Yes. Can you do it this way? Nope. You so have what, to partake. So what's better for you? Mm -hmm. That's uh, why he said. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's better for you? It's better <laughs> for you that he's not, he's, he's got a representative here. Okay, but Martin, one day it will be over and he will actually be there. Is that then, isn't it better if he never is there? No, 
no, because you have to have eventually the reward for what you've tried to represent. Ah, in other words, if you have developed the character, mm. then it's no longer necessary that he be absentee. Exactly. Then he can be fellowship. Okay, so as long as sin reigns, it's better that he be an absentee. Yeah. And as soon as sin is overcome, completely eradicated, it's no longer necessary to be an absentee. Mm. Does that make sense? That makes a lot of sense, actually, now. Yes. So the accusation of the devil in that movie, is it true or is it false? No, totally false. He's a liar. From the beginning. <laughs> He's always been a liar. All right? The third way mm. that you gain this is by experience. That's why I mentioned my wife's book, too. Not because of any selfish motive or tapping on the shoulder, but just to show how God worked. And how, if through experience, you gain the, a better knowledge. A better the, knowledge and understanding, because you, you wrestle with them and you, you try to understand. And one is very inclined to have all the accusations that come out of the devil's mouth. Yeah. But eventually, once you start understanding the issue, you say, woe is me, I am undone. Mm. I'm a man of unclean lips living amongst the people of unclean lips. And then he says, uh, who shall I send? And I say, okay, send me. <laughs> <laughs> Here I am. Here I am. In actual experience, Christ has overcome the world. And how great is his love to us when he invites us to come to him in all our afflictions, distresses, heartaches, perplexities, with the assurance that he will help us. He will bring health and brightness into our lives. If we place our hand in the hand of Jesus Christ, he will place our feet on solid rock, a better foundation than we ever had before. He will make us more strong in his strength, and he will work with all our efforts. Then, when our own souls have experienced his healing touch, we are brought into close fellowship with Jesus, and we will be laborers together with God, not only to restoring the erring, to repair broken hearts and souls, but to impart courage and faith and confidence. This is the work of God's laborers. To bring to Jesus souls who have gone away from his direct teachings and have apparently gone to pieces on the rocks and reefs of sin. These broken lives, which have been apparently hopeless, he promises to make whole. So Martin, this is training of the highest order. Yeah. Huh? In real life, in Literal experiences. So you have to learn to pray. Mm -hmm. And you don't need prayer if he's not an absentee. No. Because there's that hymn, Sweet Hour of Prayer. prayer. Farewell, farewell, <laughs> sweet hour of prayer. You don't need it anymore, right? So you need prayer. Yeah. Uh, for prayer, you need faith. That's it. Because who are you going to pray to? Mm. And why are you going to pray to someone? And you need to, a knowledge of the word. Otherwise, you're going to despair. And then you need an experience. Yeah. And you can only have all three of those if he's an absentee landlord. Yeah. <laughs> Without being an absentee landlord. Because you have fellowship. Yeah. So what is yeah. the <laughs> basis of everything? Fellowship. That's it. Fellowship. You mean to tell me, Martin, God wants fellowship with us sinners? How much? So much that he actually came and died for it. That's a pretty deep thought, right? Yeah. That's a pretty deep <laughs> thought. All right, let's read another quote. If the majesty of heaven could do so much to evidence his love for man, what ought, ought not men to be willing to do for each other to help one another up out of the pit of darkness and suffering? Martin, this is the test. Are you going to sit and whine? Mm -hmm. Are you going to accuse constantly? Are you 
going to be fault finding constantly? Or are you prepared to get your hands dirty? Get your hands dirty and do what he would do. Okay. Yeah. Whatever it costs you your life. Then so it so be it. It cost his life. Okay. Said Christ, love one another as I have loved you, not with a greater love. For greater love has no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. Our love is frequently selfish. For we confine it to prescribed limits. When we come into close union and fellowship with Jesus Christ, our love and sympathy and our works of benevolence will reach down deeper and will widen and strengthen with exercise. The love and interest of Christ's followers must be as broad as the world, and those who live merely for me and mine will fail of heaven. Mm. Martin, there are religions which are so self-centered you know, that there is no love for the world. That's, no it, love for Hollywood's, the world. Hollywood's um, motto is believe in yourself, follow your heart. That's selfish. That's absolute selfishness. It's all based on the principles of Luciferian yeah. thinking. It's based on aprons. It's, which it's, are fig leaves. And you know, actually, and we will talk about this also sometime, sports is also built on selfishness. Yes, we need to talk about sport. We'll, we'll, we need to make some more enemies <laughs> <laughs> and music. Oh. <laughs> All right, let's have a look how this works in uh, real life. You have the testing of Job. For those who love God, those who are the called according to his purpose, Romans 8.28, Bible biography has a yet higher lesson of the ministry of sorrow. You are my witnesses, says the Lord, that I am God. Witnesses that he is good and that goodness is supreme. We are made a theater unto the world, both to angels and to men. 1 Corinthians 4, 9. So the presence of God is enacted in his followers. Yeah. So he's not an absentee landlord. No. We come back to that all the it's time. Amazing. But in the crucible of the world, you learn to understand what the issue is in the great controversy. And that's why your wife wrote the book. Because in the crucible, You've been to actually understand being the representative. Okay. And Martin, is anybody excluded from the crucible? No. <laughs> Why Some, do they all shout like crazy when they're in the crucible? Because you don't understand fully why you are there. Did Job's friends understand? No. No, they Did played the blame game. <laughs> <laughs> Who was to blame? Yeah, what did you do? Who is this? What so, is this? Whose fault was it, they asked Jesus. <laughs> was it his fault or his parents' fault that he was born blind? Somebody has to get the blame. Unselfishness. The principle of God's kingdom is the principle that Satan hates. Didn't we speak about yeah, that? That's it. Its very existence he denies. From the beginning of the great controversy, he has endeavored to prove God's principles of action to be selfish. When I was an atheist, I was absolutely convinced that God is 100% selfish. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I denied his very existence. He wants you to grovel in front of him, fall on your knees, worship him from mm -hmm. morning till night, and that's it. And that is a useless form of worship. Mm. You actually worship and fall on him because sacrifice and offering he doesn't require. The sacrifices of a contrite heart, that is That's what, what he, he seeks. So he wants you to have this unselfish character because only in an unselfish character environment can love thrive. You have to have the right manure <laughs> to make the plant grow. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it is. And 
once again, if you misunderstand this, you'll see this as wimpfulness. I don't know if that's even a word, but... Well, make it up. It's a pretty <laughs> good one. You're just a wimp if you don't want to stand up and be a man, man. What? Okay. Yeah. That's, so, that's how you thought, because everybody that goes on his knees in front of somebody is a wimp. All right. So to disprove Satan's claim is the work of Christ and of all who bear his name. That's the crux of the matter. And if you want to disprove Satan's claim, you have to, in this world, live the life that Christ lived. You have to. Because and you will be accused. You will, because then you're his representative. Then you are forming part of helping him not being absentee. It was to give in his own life an illustration of unselfishness that Jesus came in the form of humanity. And all who accept this principle are to be workers together with him in demonstrating it in practical life. This is why God in his wisdom chose to be the so-called absentee landlord. The absenteeism of God is a stroke of brilliance. Yeah. Now, if he were a tyrant, it would be a sign of weakness. That's it. <laughs> but if he is unselfish, yes. it's a stroke of genius. Yes. And that's, that's the bottom line. We can actually stop <laughs> you. <can> stop now. <laughs> to choose the right because it is right to stand for truth at the cost of suffering and sacrifice. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their righteousness is of me, says the Lord. Isaiah 54, verse 17. Martin, there it stands in the scriptures. That makes me think of that. He will be so settled in the truth as not to be moved. So what is truth? He is the truth. Yeah. You must understand his character. All of these questions that are constantly bombarding humanity's minds have to be answered. Mm -hmm. We have to answer them. That's it. But you can. You can, yes. You just but have unfortunately, to you're going to suffer when you do it. That's it. You, uh, the, the place where you get the answers, people don't like. No. So very early in the history of the world, is given the life record of one over whom this controversy of Satan was waged. Of Job, the patriarch of Uz, the testimony of the search of hearts was, there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Against this man Satan brought scornful charge. Thus Job, fear God for naught? Hast thou not made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he has on every side? Put forth thine hand now and touch all that he has. Touch his bone and his flesh and he will curse thee to thy face. The Lord said unto Satan, All that he has is in thy power. Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. So was he proved? Yes, definitely. So, did it show that he was not base metal, but a precious jewel? So, we've actually got the same, I'm sure, same accusation from Satan for all of us. We're all Job. Yeah. Job is a type. Mm -hmm. We're all Job. And we can either come out like Job, even if he slay me, yet will I trust him, or his wife, curse God and die. die. Yeah. That's a choice. That's a choice. We all have to make that choice. And many, I'm afraid, will make the choice, curse God and die. Mm. Thus permitted, Satan swept away all that Job possessed, flocks and herds, manservants and maidens, sons and daughters, and he smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. Still another element of bitterness was added to his cup, his friends, Seeing in adversity but the retribution of sin pressed on his bruised and burdened spirit their accusations of wrongdoing. That's why my wife wrote the book. Mm -hmm. 
because people were looking at some times and some trouble that you were going through and they had the same accusations as Job's friends. And you try and stand up for for God yeah. mm -hmm. and you get blasted <laughs> off <laughs> the kingdom. Just get up. Just say a simple verse. In the beginning God created. <laughs> <laughs> the entire academic world comes down on you like a ton of bricks. Yeah. Tries to squash you like a maggot. Hmm? Say, cheese is not fit to be introduced into the human stomach. What happens to you, Martin? <laughs> Say that at the a potluck. Falls. <laughs> Say that at a potluck. What happens? <laughs> that was for that time. <laughs> this woman is not a prophet. <laughs> that was for that time. No, Doesn't matter what you say. You also get those friends then. <laughs> there are lots of them around. Lots of them. So Martin, seemingly forsaken of heaven and earth, yet holding fast his faith in God and his consciousness of integrity, in anguish and perplexity he cried, My soul is weary of my life. Oh, that thou wouldst hide me in the grave, that thou wouldst keep me secret until thy wrath be past. Didn't Jeremiah say the same thing? <laughs> yes. I've said it many times. Uh -huh. said, can we? Can I just? Can everything just happen? Just leave me alone for a while. <laughs> <laughs> well, haven't we said that in the in a, <laughs> a few times in the past? Absolutely, we've well, said that. Not so distant past. <laughs> yeah, sometimes one just wants to despair, right? <laughs> Where's the landlord? <laughs> I can't handle this. That thou wouldst appoint me a set time and remember me. Behold, I cry out of wrong, but I am not heard. I cry for help, but there is no judgment. He has stripped me of my glory and taken the crown from my head. My kinsfolk have failed, and my familiar friends have forgotten me. They whom I loved are turned against me. Have pity upon me, have pity upon me, O ye my friends." For the hand of God has touched me. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat. Is he accusing God almost of being an absentee <laughs> landlord? <laughs> yes, he is. But he's not wailing to God. Yeah? He's, he's wailing to the friends <laughs> that God is absent. All right, so he didn't give up on God. No. But the situation is just overwhelming. Will we experience it? Oh, for sure. It's a promise. It's a for sure. Okay. Behold, I go forward, but he is not there, and backwards, but I cannot perceive him. Where is he? He's an absentee landlord. When I need him most, he's not there. So Martin, his reactions and his statements that he made, were they right? Well, it depends on how we see it. He is right and wrong. If he really looked for God, he would find him. But in that circumstance, yes, he's right. It's All right. So his accusation, no, his accusers were actually the ones that were wrong, and God reprimanded them. Hmm. God did not leave him in that situation. In fact, God was more present in that situation than in any other. That's what we have to learn. That's exactly. And... Martin, in the times that we are living in now, we will, we will have to learn that. You see, that's the thing. There's, a sm there's let's say, smoke in front and God is behind it. But now Satan we, is, push is blowing the smoke. Now we see through a glass darkly. That's it. So we have to realize this dark glass, this smoke is not from God. He's there. We just have to get through this. All right, Martin, why are we doing this in the first place? Why are we having these discussions? Because this is preparation for the final conflict. Exactly. So, yeah, we're sitting here and grinning and smiling. And because we realize we're sitting in the same boat. Yes, that's, what makes, it, that's what makes it so familiar that you can actually smile about you it. You see, so when you read this, then I start realizing, okay, now I, maybe I must work a little bit on some things. In, inside, so yeah. this is what it's supposed to do to to the to everybody. Preparation for the final crisis. Okay, 
So he's looking for him and he can't find him. On the left hand, where he does work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand and I cannot see him. He knoweth the way that I take. When he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Did he understand? Yes. Yeah. Yes, he understood it. And what was he, what did he realize that he was being tried? Yeah. He realized, okay, wait, he's not an absentee landlord. No, he must be right here because he's trying me in the fire. Yeah. I know that my Redeemer liveth and that he shall stand up at the last upon the earth and after my skin has been destroyed, this shall be even from my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not as a stranger. Does he have the hope of the second coming? Yes. Wow, beautiful is that. Huh? Must he's, we have it? He, exactly. He's not hoping for that right there. He's hoping for the second coming. Correct. So according to his faith, so was it unto Job. When he has tried me, he said, I shall come forth as gold. So this is the whole issue. If you want to be in this school, then you have to go through the process. And actually, we all have to want to be in this school. And you have to be a representative of the character of God. Because Satan accused him of having a, a false reason for following God. You know what? You were mentioning something earlier, and I was just thinking now this coming forth as gold. It's never easy to come forth as gold. No. It's the whole time a crucible. It's a purifying thing. So, And people don't like that. And I, We cannot exclude ourselves. No, no. We also <laughs> scream like, <laughs> like suckling pigs. But I think the main difference is we have to want to then you can take it but if you want to be again holding unto certain things that's when it's becoming very that, difficult that's when it becomes difficult but then it said so it came to pass by his patient endurance he vindicated his own character and thus the character of him whose representative he was so what are we going to do when all of these things happen to us, and when this time of trouble comes upon us, whose representative are we going to be? Christ. Are we going to shout, absentee landlord? No. Why did you not prevent this? That's when we have to study his character. So the Lord turned the captivity of Job. Also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than the beginning. Now, the blessing that we are awaiting is not a temporal blessing. No. It's a heavenly blessing. An eternal one. And this is where we have to go. So on the record of those who through self-abnegation have entered into the fellowship of Christ's sufferings stand one on the Old Testament and one in the New. The names of Jonathan and of John the Baptist. Now, Martin, it struck me that she should use those two names, particularly Jonathan. Mm -hmm. Jonathan, by birth, heir to the throne, yet knowing himself set aside by the divine decree, to his rival, the most tender and faithful of his friends, shielding David's life at the peril of his own, steadfast at his father's side through the dark days of his declining power, and at his side falling at the last. The name of Jonathan is treasured in heaven, and it stands on earth a witness to the existence and power of unselfish love. That's amazing, eh? Yeah. Amazing. John the Baptist, you know, is very similar. Mm -hmm. He's the one who said, he must increase and I must decrease. So John Baptist, the Baptist, at his appearance as the Messiah's herald, stirred the nation. From the place to place, his steps were followed by vast throngs of people of every rank and station. But when the one came to whom he had borne witness, all was changed. The crowds followed Jesus, and John's work seemed fast closing. 
Yet there was no wavering of his faith. He must increase, he said, but I must decrease. John 3.30 Time passed and the kingdom which John had confidently expected was not established. In Herod's dungeon, cut off from the life-giving air and the desert freedom, he waited and watched. There was no display of arms, no rending of prison doors, but the healing of the sick, the preaching of the gospel, the uplifting of men's souls testified to Christ's mission. Alone in the dungeon, seeing whether his path, like his master's, tended, John accepted the trust. Fellowship with Christ in sacrifice. That's it. So he was experiencing this absenteeism. He but he had fellowship in the absenteeism. In the, in the end. Yes. He third, first had all of this and he was uh, because nothing happened. And he the, had all these questions. Yeah. And he sent his disciples out to and ask, was no, are you the one or do we wait for another? And then he found this fellowship. Yes. Heaven's messengers attended him to the grave. The intelligences of the universe, fallen and unfallen, witnessed his vindication of unselfish service. Qualified him for heaven. Unselfish. Now, well, that leaves the question, what about us, Martin? No. Hmm? What about us? In all the generations that have passed since then, suffering souls have been sustained by the testimony of John's life. In the dungeon, on the scaffold, in the flames, men and women through centuries of darkness have been strengthened by the memory of him of whom Christ declared. Among them that are born of women, there has not risen a greater. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah. You know, Martin, when I read those names, I wonder why are they included in the Hall of Fame? They made so many mistakes, these people. But that's how God works. It, it's about rectifying the mistake. What's it? Uh, Seven times you fall, but just get up again. And Samuel and the prophets. Samuel was an excellent example. Who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings. Yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment, they were stoned, they were sawn of thunder, they were tempted, they were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy, they wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and in caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. What a beautiful mm. verse. Yeah, no. well. Is he an absentee landlord? No. No. Did Samson know it? Yes. <laughs> John the Baptist realized Do you it. know it? I'm busy doing it. <laughs> All right. We're learning. He's not an absentee landlord. We have to represent him. And the world has to see it. And the world has to understand it. And very soon, the conflict will come to a head. Mm. And may God grant us wisdom. We haven't completed the study. It's too long for one session so let's continue in another episode and see if we can add some some thoughts to this very intriguing subject the absentee landlord shall we pray please heavenly father thank you that you are not an absentee landlord even though you are an absentee landlord but in those that you have chosen to represent you, in the crucibles of this world, you have placed a record and a presence of yourself. 
which will echo and re-echo through the ages until we come to that final conflict. And if we cling to our hope and cling to our faith, we will hear those words one day, well done, good and faithful servant. Thank you for the promises. Thank you for your presence in our lives, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.